We have very good friends at the Baltimore Sun to whom we are enormously indebted. The Baltimore Sun has been a marvelous financial supporter of this council since it was founded. We have had the annual Baltimore Sun foreign policy panel since our first year in 1980. And uh, in numerous other ways, uh, the Sun is an institution, but most importantly, uh, its personnel have been good friends of the council. Now, most of you know Dan Berger, whose title I think is assistant uh, editorial writer. Editorial writer. Joe, Joe, Joe Stern has no assistance, but, but uh, editorial writer. And uh, Dan is with us very often uh, at many of our sessions. And uh, many of you know uh, Richard O'Mara as well, who was the former foreign policy editor of The Sun, uh, who was good enough a number of years ago to participate in a set of panels when we uh, the council sponsored the, or hosted, I should say, the State Department's regional conference. And uh, Ms. Clara Germani is with us for the first time. We're delighted to have her. And uh, she uh, reported on Haiti for the Christian Science Monitor before her present position, which is, I believe, uh, Assistant National Editor at the Sun. Uh, and these good people have agreed on very short notice to share their wisdom with us. And to tell you more about them and what they're going to say, uh, let me turn the panel over to uh, Mr. Dan Berger. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we put our act together uh, <laughs> 10 minutes ago. Uh, Clara Germani is the assistant national editor of the Baltimore Sun, and for a considerable number of years, she was a Latin America correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. She's been to Haiti quite a bit, and she wrote about this problem in our perspective section a couple of Sundays ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will turn to her first for uh, background on how we got here. Okay. Uh, my history with Haiti goes back to just 1986, which, uh, and before that I read a lot, but um, in 1986, I'll give you just a little background here, um, the Duvalier, uh, baby Doc Duvalier, who was the son of Papa Doc Duvalier, um, was overthrown. Uh, he left of his own accord, but basically it's believed that it was internal politics as well as a little bit of a U.S. push, as well as the people rising up a bit, uh, as much as they could without arms, um, and their dissatisfaction that pushed him away. Um, since then, what you've had is a series of military-backed governments. Whether there were elections or not, the military was involved in some way. Um, I, I think there, I, I, can't, I haven't counted, but I think that there have been five or six chiefs of state at least since 1986, possibly more. Um, but they come and go very quickly, and all of them being backed by the military have virtually have no control over the situation there. It's the military that quietly controls things from behind the scenes. Um, in, it, during this period, there was a lot of diplomacy to make an election that was democratic. Now, what you have there is a country that is basically 80 percent illiterate, and, and by that I mean they cannot read, write, uh, they don't understand, I mean, by virtue of not being able to read and write, they don't have the, um, the background in what democracy as we know it is. I mean, they, voting to them means somehow an instantaneous change in their lives, or, or many people feel that way, and when they would vote, that didn't happen. And so you can imagine this, this dissatisfaction that, the, that would build within these people. So over the years, you have, you have this series of uh, efforts to make democracy happen, uh, some form of democracy, a democratic election. It did finally happen in 1990, uh, or was it 91? I'm, I've got to get my... Anyway, it was three years ago. It would have been the end of 91. Um, Aristide uh, was elected, President Aristide was elected. He was a Marxist priest who 
preached liberation theology. And if you go back to the early year, 1986, when Duvalier was overthrown, he was responsible for much of the discontent in the, in the, the average population, the people on the street. Um, he'd, built a, uh, he'd helped build a radio system, which is the way people would get their uh, news there because they couldn't read or write. And so this, there was a Catholic radio system that he had, had been involved with uh, kind of marginally, but in, in promoting what, what they said, he was involved in that. And, and he was very loved by many, many common folk. Now, the, the, the wealthier people who really run the country don't like him because he's a Marxist and believes in redistribution of wealth by violence if necessary, and he preached that. And today, he, he says he did not preach that and does not, but if you read the transcripts of what he says, it, it's, it's very obvious that he, there are veiled threats of violence that he promotes. Um, anyway, he was elected, and it was a fair and free election. It was, it was certified by many observers. He was in office for eight months, and the military overthrew him. Just uh, perhaps two days before he was overthrown, he had given a speech, which is considered the reason he was overthrown at that moment. And the speech said something about the smell of um, Père Le Brun is a beautiful smell. Père Le Brun is a figure in Haiti of a, it's a tire man. It's the advertisement for t rubber tires. And Père Le Brun means it's, that's the company that sells them. And rubber tires would be thrown around people's necks like the necklacing in South Africa. And he said, this smells very sweet. And the upper classes were scared to death. And that was perhaps the precipitating event for his overthrow. And since then, what you have is the United States backing him because he is the f fairly elected president of that country. And that's where we are today, with him out for two and a half years, almost, in, in the, waiting in the United States to return. Thanks. Um, about two years ago, I introduced, had the great pleasure of introducing Lawrence Pizzullo to this gathering at this, in this room. And when I did so and was introduced to him, I thought, gee, this guy's face looks familiar. Where is he? Is he a generic everyman? Where do I see him? And a few days later, I worked it out. I saw him on the bus coming to work. <laughs> and we got together and had some uh, wonderful conversations. We settled many problems of the world and left some others unsettled. Um, and I came to have the highest regard for him. And I came to think that all the great things I'd said about him were probably true. Uh, he was a Baltimorean as uh, executive director of, of Catholic Relief Services. He brought that agency here from New York. He was a retired Foreign Service officer who became an international relief worker. Then Clinton came to power and he became a retired international relief worker who became a Foreign Service officer once again. Uh, he's past retirement age. He, he, uh, his great day, although he was a career Foreign Service man, he really came to his peak in policy in, during the Carter administration, where he was ambassador to <coughs> Uruguay and he was called in a rush to rush up to Nicaragua and talk Somoza, the dictator, out of office, which he did. He's just written a book about it. It just came out a few months ago. He worked then for the politically appointed Deputy Secretary of State Warren Christopher. When the Clinton administration came to power, committed to do all sorts of good things, always on the side of the angels, and going to put President Aristide back in office, with Warren Christopher as Secretary of State, they asked Lawrence Pizzullo to come in as, in the State Department, as head of the policy on Haiti. There's also an ambassador to Haiti. He's not it. Uh, clearly, he went back believing 
that restoring Aristide was doable, that Clinton was committed to do it, and that he'd be in charge of doing it, and that he knew how to arrange it. Um, I think his great triumph, uh, and it was a triumph, or so it seemed, was the July conference at Governor's Island in New York Harbor, in which General Cedras agreed to give up power and restore President Aristide with the U.S. guaranteeing things and a somewhat complicated formula that seemed to put some restraints on President Aristide, perhaps to see to it that he didn't necklace anyone, I don't know. Uh, some months later, this didn't happen. And all the things that were agreed to at Governor's Island did not transpire. Uh, in my mind, and it's just uh, my kind of, of uh, looking at things, I thought there was a relationship to General Idid in Mogadishu surviving our attempts to kidnap him and to overthrow him and to do away with his forces. We said we're going to. We didn't. And then all of a sudden, General Cedras was saying, no, I'm not going to do what I we're not going to do that. We're not going to give everything away to the President Aristide. Sometime after that, in frustration, the American government, which has to include Larry Pizzullo, found Aristide very difficult to deal with. And then there was a, there was a CIA leak to a right-wing senator of raw information suggesting that Aristide was an unstable personality and uh, really a very untrustworthy character. And uh, I wonder, gee, is the CIA trying to derail the State Department? Or has the whole government perhaps having second thoughts about uh, putting all its eggs in this basket and trusting its own reputation to this man, Aristide. Um, I, I, I'm not sure which I concluded between those two things. <coughs> Haitian policy since then has clearly not worked. We have sanctions. The sanctions are designed to hurt, hurt the rich and not the poor. Um, the, the uh, gasoline is being uh, smuggled through the Dominican Republic. The rich are still rich. Uh, I think you pointed out that, that American textile firms are exempted from it. They're still producing baseballs, is that right? Uh, yeah, not, not Major League Baseballs. Not Major League Baseball. Baseballs. <laughs> uh, baseballs are textiles, isn't that right? I, That's how they get a, through. It's a, a, an assembly. But I mean, under the law, they're textiles, and therefore, oh, well, I guess. <laughs> if textiles are excluded there. Um, on March 24, the, the Congressional Black Caucus and its chairman, uh, Congressman uh, Kwesi Mafumi of the 7th District of Maryland, called American policy racist by which they meant our immigration policy, by which we turn back Haitians to Haiti before we give them a chance to say they want political asylum. If they got to say that, we'd have to hear them out. But if we don't let them say it, uh, we don't have to. And it called for Larry Pizzullo's resignation. And the reason for that was very clear. He was supposed to put Aristide back in power, and he hasn't done it. So get out and let someone else try. Um, it's a way of putting pressure on Clinton. They didn't want to 
call for Clinton to resign. They didn't want to call for Warren Christopher to resign. They didn't want to call for Anthony Lake to resign. So that's what Pizzullo is for. You can call on him to resign. Maybe he will. Um, in just the past few days, UN Observer has reported a list of 112 summary executions in Haiti of supporters of Aristide and of dissidents and made it very clear there is not a civil war going on, there is not an insurrection, this is all one way. The army and, and the uh, uh, militia, whatever you want to call them, used to be Tantan Makut, they are doing it, nobody's doing it to them in this current wave. Uh, Yesterday, Aristide said that he was abrogating a treaty that, that the Reagan administration made with Baby Doc that gives us the right to send all Haitians back to Haiti, all boat people. And the reason it, that he's abrogating it is uh, considerable reports of uh, when people who try to flee Haiti are sent back there, at least some of them are arrested, some of them are executed, some of them are tortured, which if they weren't political exiles before, they certainly are then. Uh, now, the person who announced this abrogation of the treaty <coughs> was Mike Barnes, a former congressman from Maryland, who was engaged by Aristide and paid as his uh, lawyer in Washington. You know how you have influence in Washington, you buy it, everyone has to do it. If you're penniless, you still buy it, you take aid and use it to pay your lawyer in Washington. American aid will recirculate in Washington. Uh, Barnes has announced since then that he's doing this pro bono and he's become a great believer in this cause. In any case, he is now Aristide's principal spokesman, so far as I can tell, in Washington. Uh, there is a crisis in our Haitian policy. It isn't working. It has failed. It's collapsing before our eyes. Now that is why Larry didn't show up today. <laughs> and when I put it to colleagues, uh, one suggested, well, he may not be in the loop anymore. Another suggested, and gave a reason for this, that when Al Gore met with Aristide, Larry was not there. Uh, and another may be that, that uh, um, that he's fed up, I don't know. Another may be that there are all sorts of conferences going on. What to do now? I know there are such conferences going on. Um, Anthony Lake, the, the uh, National Security Advisor, just gave a talk at the Hopkins campus at 4 o'clock because he wants to get some messages out on Bosnia. And I went, and in the question time afterwards, milling about with students, uh, to prepare for this talk. Uh, I said, what about Haiti? Is it back to the drawing board? And he looked me in the eye and said, well, not back to the drawing board, but we do have to review where we go from here. And I'd like to talk to you about it, <laughs> but not in front of all these students. So. Uh, and I said, it seems to me that you either have to, that, that we, we've stated a goal and the amount of leverage we're going to use to achieve it won't do it. You either have to raise the force to what we said was unacceptable, which is military force, or lower the goal. And he said to me, as a professor, I can't dispute your analysis. <laughs> and 
and he was giving me meaningful looks I wish I could interpret for this group. <laughs> I think those looks were off the record or out of deep background, I don't know. So this would perhaps in my mind confirm the notion that there are in fact important conferences going on and Lawrence Pizzullo is in them. I don't know. Uh, but that's as much as I can tell you about why Larry Pizzullo is not here today. Uh, Rich O'Mara used to be the Sun's Latin American correspondent and he was all over Latin and Central America and that was a very long time ago and after that he was foreign editor of the Sun and he sent everyone else all around the world. <laughs> And then he was our correspondent in London, and now he's a writer here in Baltimore. Rich? Uh, well, I don't know where Mr. Pizzullo is, but I think that maybe he's over there responding to that New York Times piece today that said <laughs> that the Clinton administration has given up and they're not going to expect Aristide to get back into power, and they're trying to find the language to explain that without really saying it. Uh, I'm no expert on Haiti, and I'm, I'm a draftee but we'll do our best. I think there are a number of things that I do know, or think I know, about Haiti that might be worth passing on. There's, Haiti has a political culture that's very Latin, although Haiti is not necessarily a Latin country. Uh, there, there, are, there are habits of politics that are fading now throughout that region. One of them is that Haitian politicians don't compromise. The aim of politics is to get into power. You don't get into power by forming coalitions. Coalitions come apart. And besides, coalition power is diluted power. Aristide can't compromise with the generals uh, because it goes against the culture of Haitian politics. He'd also be stupid because uh, the, the generals are obviously not to be trusted because of the way they welched on the Governor's Island deal. Another, another principle of Haitian politics, I think, is uh, that exiled politicians remain exiled politicians. No one regains power in Haiti from abroad. Governments are overthrown in Haiti, but they are overthrown from within, from people who are on Haitian soil. This may be the most important principle of all, at least in connection with what I'm going to tell you in a minute, uh, which is, of course, not didn't come from my brain but someone else's. Another thing is uh, worth knowing, it's not a principle, but it's worth knowing and, and not too many people are aware of it. But in Haiti, the ratio of military personnel to civilian personnel is perhaps the lowest in Latin America, except for one country, uh, Costa Rica. And again, there's a connection between those two facts. Uh, there was a young man, well, I don't know if he's a young man, but he sounds like a young man. His name is Anthony Mango, who is an academic in Florida International University. And he recently put together a paper in which he looked at the various scenarios that had been advanced for dealing with the Haitian problem. The Haitian problem being the administration's problem and, and simply a large problem. And the principal scenario, or the one that's bandied about, the one that seems to be favored by editorial writers is armed intervention. Well, it's a small country, and uh, in many ways we've been there before. The, uh, and it is the having been there before that is the principal cautionary note here. The, uh, the United States occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934. The Marines were in there. We occupied their uh, customs operation from 1905 to 1934. The occupation by the U.S. Marines of Haiti all those years is still very deeply felt. It was a terrible, terrible experience for the Haitians uh, because they lost thousands of people and the Marines didn't lose too many. Also, back in those days, uh, I'm sure you know, racial sensitivities weren't so refined. And white Marines in, in black Haiti really was a formula for uh, disaster, or at least a historical disaster. The, uh, the occupation is still felt. When the Marines withdrew, the, uh, the, the memory of it was cultivated and it is still cultivated by 
uh, by Haitian politicians, not the least uh, Father Aristide. Father Aristide, as Claire, Claire pointed out, regarded the United States as the source of all Haiti's ills and made a career of, uh, of saying that, and he generated a lot of popular support behind that. That would not have been possible had it not been for that long period of occupation. So Professor Mangel suggests that maybe intervention is not the best thing, especially now sending armed forces, American armed forces, into a black nation. Firstly, it wouldn't be tolerated by the Black Caucus, not that they are, are uh, likely to be able to, to, to uh, prevent that, but it would generally, uh, I think, smack of a white intervention once again. The second, the second option or the second scenario that has, one is in place, the policy, uh, the policy of sanctions. As Dan said, and everybody knows, the sanctions don't really work. They work, but they work on the wrong people. They work on people, poor people. Uh, the elites who are running the country to whatever degree they are uh, don't feel the pain of the sanctions. They take all the gasoline. They take all the fuel oil. They take all the, all the goods that are flooding in through the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic is not really interested in sealing off its border with Haiti. There's, there's money to be made there, and they're not really interested in involving themselves in Haitian affairs, and that's what that would be. Uh, also, there is a, a more permanent damage done by the sanction. When Haitians don't have fuel, they chop down trees. And Haiti has precious few trees now, and it is a denuded country, basically. And this kind of, this kind of pressure just continues that sort of deprivation. Uh, the third scenario that has been advanced is let Aristide make the policy. Let Aristide decide what should be done, and we'll get behind it. As as far as I know, Aristide has been kind of distant from the from the Clinton administration. There's not too much cooperation or um, or um, collaboration between the two groups. So the administration, the Clinton administration, is enunciating policy a policy of protection of a of a, a man who won't essentially participate in this. Uh, so one might. One wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know what Aristide could conceive of. I, Aristide has not indicated uh, a desire for a military intervention. It is against the Haitian constitution that he's supposed, he's supposed to uphold. Anybody who assists a foreign power is guilty of treason. It also would strike terribly among Haitians who, uh, who've never countenanced that sort of thing, at least the majority of Haitians. So that was three scenarios, none of which seemed to work. Uh, Professor Mang Mango has suggested another one, and he calls it a national liberation campaign or a protected national liberation campaign. That is, a campaign protected by the United States. The idea uh, would be for Father Aristide to just disappear from sight for a period of time to stimulate an information campaign in Haiti that he's coming back. And then, at some point, shortly, within weeks of his disappearance, to appear, to show up somewhere in Haiti, denounce the government, and call for recognition of his own government. Um, he could operate, the idea is that he could operate in a more remote part of, of Haiti. The fact that the, the Haitian military is kind of primitive, cannot move around as, as well as one might think, would facilitate an operation like that. He could be supplied by the U.S. fleet. He could be supported by the U.S. government, which would be the U.S. government supporting a government that was al already in Haiti, again, not supporting an exile. It would be able to, the Black Caucus could recognize Haiti, uh, the government in Haiti. And uh, probably this way could generate a, the kind of, the kind of moving support that might bring him back to power. It's, it's not, it's not a, uh, a far-fetched idea. 
it has never worked in Haiti because it's never been tried, but it certainly has worked elsewhere. And just one precedent, and that was in Costa Rica. In 1948, when the governing the power, the, the party in power refused to concede power after it lost an election, uh, the vice president of the opposing party, Pepe Figueres, disappeared, then reappeared, and did the same thing that Professor Mango is suggesting that uh, that uh, Aristide does, to declare the new government legitimate and residing in some other part of the of the country, and people followed uh, Figueres, and, they, and, and the pressure was so great the government conceded. I don't know if it would work, but I think that uh, it wouldn't be worth, wouldn't be hard, it wouldn't be such a bad idea to try since nothing else seems to. Okay, so. Uh, the question is, what are the views of other governments in the region? Uh, my understanding, myself, is that uh, they're not really much interested in involving themselves in this. There's also something else, too, that has weakened in recent years. There used to be a greater cohesion within the organization of American states for joint action in question in cases like this. Now. It was usually the United States that stimulated this, as in the case of the Dominican Republic. But even so, uh, that that sense of, of uh, that inclination to joint action was always there, and uh, my understanding is now that it's much weaker than it ever was. That, that was what the OAS did initially. That it was the first time they were able, uh, when Aristide was overthrown, it was the first time that the OAS was able to um, activate a clause that they had passed in, in their in their bylaws just six months earlier that um, it was done in Santiago and it was called the Santiago something right, pact or something which said that when there's an overthrow we are going to act right away and call for um, support for the democratically elected government and it was the first time they did that and it was seen initially when um, I, I actually wrote about the OAS at that time as a last gasp for them to, to be a meaningful organization and they, they tried to do this and there was all kinds of um, uh, everyone came together. Venezuela was particularly interested in it at the time because Cap was having, uh, the president of, of Venezuela was having some problems at that time. And, um, but it, it did crumble because they, they had the initial effort to put, to get him, uh, Aristide back. And theirs failed within months. I mean, it just, it didn't, it didn't come together. But they, they do support him largely, I mean, in principle, as much as anybody supports him. But, I mean, because everyone who's dealt with him, any government that has dealt with him does have, with Aristide himself, does have problems of principle with the guy because he doesn't, he does, he goes back on his promises. And that's, that's a regular thing he does. And so even though they back him as the democratically elected president, they'd rather have somebody easier to work with, that's for sure. Uh, two Francophone governments show sympathy and, and understanding and interest up to a point, and they are France and Canada. Um, I, I'm not sure they're prepared to be real players. I don't think they are. The uh, question has uh, two parts. Uh, one is the observation that the American military doesn't look the same today as it did in the 1930s. And the second one is a improvisation of a uh, self-consciously created black force. And the question is, um, why wouldn't that work? Um, why wouldn't it work? The problem with interventions are always not the immediate impact, but the aftermath. The, the United States, has, every time we've intervened everywhere, even if people welcome us with open arms, it doesn't take them long to turn against us. Somalia is the most recent example of that. And that surely would happen here. There are about 7,000 armed troops in Haiti. That's all. That's nothing. The rest and the real terrorists in that country are the attaches, the, the kind of the heirs of the Tonton Makou. So what you have there, and they're well armed, so what you have there is the potential for guerrilla violence, that sort of thing, and the long deterioration of, a, of, an, of an occupation it, as, it, as it always event, eventuates. I don't think it would work for that reason. Uh, as far as as far as the constitution, the, the way the, the composition of our military, indeed, this is true. 
it's much more a racially mixed military that we have. But the idea of putting together a black unit and black officers, I think, would be highly resisted on in every 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 quarter. In the same way that a lot of black African American diplomats don't like being sent to Africa because they don't like the suggestion that that's where they're supposed to serve. So why should a should black troops or black officers expect to be sent to Haiti? It, uh, I think that you would find more resistance to it here uh, within the service itself than anywhere, frankly. I think, too, that all along the way, um, anyone who's talked about intervention has, has talked. I don't know what Mango, Tony Mango has said, but most people talk about a multilateral force from the OAS or from the UN, and that's, that's been discussed at, at, at all of these various uh, summits that they've had um, that's been a part of it. And another thing that I was going to say was RSD did ask for military intervention. He hmm. didn't call, he probably didn't call it just that, but when he met with Gore last week and even six months ago, he uh, made allusions to, he, he would like to see some military support. He doesn't want to see a, a, a huge force and, and uh, or at least this is what I've read. And it's not been publicized that much, but he does, he has said he would like that, which, which changes, um, I mean, it's a complete reversal of, of what he's always stood for because he, he does not believe in military intervention. And I, I don't think that he would want a, a, a full American force there. I think that he would also be um, interested in a multilateral force. And just one other point on, on the, the intervention in the past. One thing that to note is that, that they're still feeling, you know, the effects of military intervention in Haiti today and many, you know, in their sense of disliking the United States and our disrespect for that country. But one thing that is interesting to note is that the whole infrastructure, which is not great, uh, but most of the infrastructure that exists there is what our military built, the roads, the telephone system, the, you know, the ele what, what electricity does exist, what plumbing does exist, that was, that was our doing. Um, and it's interesting to think about that and what we might what we or a multilateral force might do today if they were able to sort of pull things together there in a way that, that uh, the Haitians aren't able to do that. I mean, it would, it would definitely be a sticky mess, and, and how we would get out, I don't know, but it's interesting to look at that hi historic contribution in, for what it's worth. I think um, military intervention is not that unlikely myself, just as a predictive matter. Um, reason is that, of course, our foreign policy is driven by domestic policy, and we, we haven't yet said what the U.S. interest is, but the political interest, to a very large extent, has been to avoid having great waves of immigration here, which have been unwelcome particularly in Florida, and this can be criticized as racist or not, take your pick, but that has, um, I think, driven our policy and has been the motive for championing reform. If we get reform, if we get that nice Father Aristide, the people will want to stay put. Uh, the one country that I've been to that seems welcoming of Haitian immigrants, not country, but is Quebec province because most immigrants to Canada want to be English-speaking, and Quebec is desperate to get immigrants who want to speak French and want their children to speak French. And it was interesting to me on, on the streets of Montreal as a tourist that, that uh, anybody who I saw on the street or in a shop who looked Asian was English speaking, was more comfortable in English than French, but anyone who was black was Francophone. And uh, I think that our immigration policy is just about collapsing. I think we have to make a reversal. And I think that the acceptance of new waves of Haitian immigrants is going to add to the pressure to get reforms in Haiti. 
I think also there is a great frustration element in policy making. You read all these nice statements about when military action is called for and you have to see the way out and you have to know what the mission is and all this stuff. None of that applies. That's not how policy is made. And it's when the country is defied by forces that are this weak, that are this close, and where American domestic policy is so much involved, that something is going to snap. And I can see a scenario. I think a couple of things, I don't think it's what's going to be decided in any conferences today or tomorrow, but um, one thing that has to happen first is that the Black Caucus has to demand it. And I don't think that's so far away. And there are some ironies in people who may be left of center and may criticize past American policies as imperialist and racist suddenly want it. But some individuals are calling for it now. Aristide has asked for it. And I think it isn't very far away. I think reading the reasons why it's ruled out by politicians in Washington the principal one is that they don't know how they would get out. They think it would be relatively easy to go in and take over. They wouldn't know how to get out, and that's a very real problem. It was, uh, there was no way to get out of Somalia, but we left anyway. But I think uh, in Haiti, we couldn't leave things in as big a mess as we were prepared to in Somalia. Uh, I, you know, I think a couple of things have to happen first, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. The question is, how viable is the uh, Haitian economy? Well, I, I haven't physically been there, well, I haven't been there since 1990, 89. Uh, but I, I mean, I've kept in touch with it, and I do know that it. The, I mean, the way it normally is, it's pretty bad. I mean, it, uh, maybe a quarter of the there's six million, seven million people somewhere in there. Most uh, of them live in the rural communities. Uh, one million lived in in Port-au-Prince, so that that'll tell you there's six six million living out in the out in the the rural areas. They raise their own animals if they if they can afford that. They, you know, uh, hack out some sort of an existence off the land. There's uh, little of a cash economy. They, there's no way to get cash. I was in one area once where the people um, couldn't, they, they had no crops to sell. So, uh, it, and there was plenty of food there being sold, but they had nothing, they had no way to get money to buy the food that was being grown by their neighbors because their land had completely been depleted. And those people were, I mean, one woman I interviewed had, had had ten children and lost six of them, so over. And I don't know where that woman is today. I'd, li I'd, I'd like to go back and find out if she ever survived. But they say there was a figure I read the other day by, from Harvard that says that since the embargo was placed on it, and there hasn't been the, the same free flow of, of food and even um, uh, emergency food, that a thousand people a month are dying. Now I don't. That that sounds. Because of the embargo and starvation, now that could be infant mortality. That could be babies that don't make it to term. I, I don't. I don't really know exactly what that means, but that's a lot. And um, but they say that the uh, in Port-au-Prince that there were about a quarter of a million people that were employed in. I'm sorry, 55,000 who were em employed at a high point in the assembly industry. That's foreign companies that come in and have electronics or textiles. Uh, sewn together there, and that those people could feed anywhere from four to ten people. So that would, you'd have their, you know, maybe everybody in Port-au-Prince being fed off these people who were making money, making a salary. But that's the only wage base I know of there would, would have been the assembly sector. You just don't get money any other way. You barter in the, in the countryside and such. And how that is now, I assume it's just a lot worse. Mm because the assembly sector now only employs, I think it's down, I think my article said 10,000 maybe employed now. So 
that many fewer people are, fe are being fed. It was inviting the uh, panel to comment on the suggestion that we use, the nation uses, whatever means appropriate and necessary to stop all immigration for a period of five years. And uh, it was suggested that, uh, the, the questioner suggested that she had been planning to write the letter, and you all heard Mr. Berger's answer. Would, you care, would the panel care to comment on that further? Uh, well, I'm rather dubious that after five years we would have straightened ourselves out. <laughs> and, and secondly, uh, of course the purpose of foreign aid is to keep people where they are because the purpose of foreign aid is to, to help economies develop. I mean, it has a benign purpose. Um, you could give, you could pour tons of money into Haiti and it would never help any of those people Claire was talking about because it would probably wind up in Paris or somewhere like that or in the pockets of a very small number of people. As far as keeping everybody out, well, I would love to hear the screams from London and from Paris and from places like, and all those Japanese businessmen who come over here. And, and, and it's just, you know, it's a great idea though. <laughs> I think you should write the letter. Sure. Will you get the, will you have the letter printed? Absolutely. <laughs> the question is, can you compare what's happening in Haiti with now with what has been going on in Guatemala? And I think the panel will have to do some interpolation, if you'll just explain what the uh, – the, the, the situations aren't at all the same. Um, in Guatemala, which is a very large, very wealthy country where everyone – most people eat. I mean, there is poverty, of course, a lot of poverty, but nothing like Haiti. It's, it's heavily forested, mountains, good road system. Uh, there's been a, a low-level guerrilla war going on for decades, on and on and on and on. And this has brought about reprisals against Indians and, and poor people in villages and far-removed areas. There's no such – opposition to the government of Haiti as that there are no successful or continuing guerrilla movements. You can't hide in Haiti. <laughs> there are no jungles. There are no, no, no forests and things like that. It's not exactly, it's not exactly the same in that regard. Um, not to say there haven't been internal wars and, and, and civil wars in, in Haiti. There have been, but not, not, not at all like that which is carried out in Guatemala. Uh. What role can the Dominican Republic play, and would it like to play a role? Well, I, I don't know exactly what they're thinking today, but I mean, if there's a little bit of history, the Dominican Republic has never been a friend of Haiti. I mean, they've cooperated and they shelter their exiled dictators. I think uh, Namfi, General Namfi, lives there, who was one of the first um, military leaders who took control after uh, Duvalier left. But again, a little bit of history will give you an idea of how they, the Haitians come over and provide cheaper labor in the Dominican Republic than, than you can get in the Dominican Republic, and that's pretty darn cheap. And um, they don't like that because it undercuts their, I mean, the businessmen like it, the farmers like it who can get cane cutters, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a good situation. They don't, uh, the government doesn't really want them there, or they tacitly allow them to be there and then, you know, pull some kind of dirty trick, uh, uh, run them out of the country or enslave them. There have been plenty of stories, I think, uh, uh, 60 Minutes did a story about the slavery uh, that they had, what, what amounted to slavery, you know, getting some of these Haitians in, in, in a situation where they weren't paid and they were stuck on a plantation and couldn't leave. Um, but uh, again, a little historic note will tell you um, there, that, that um, Haitians are, are largely a black population. The Dominican Republic has a lot of blacks also. Um, when the Haitians back in the, I, I think it was the turn of the century, when there was a particularly bad period where Haitians uh, were, were being run out of the Dominican Republic and killed even to get rid of them, there was a thing called the Hota test. What do, you, do you know about it? No. It's the, the H sound uh, in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And Dominicans, of course, speak Spanish. 
and the Haitian speak Haitian Creole. And Haitian Creole, in Haitian Creole, you can't, there's no, there's no huh or, or hota sound. Hota. And they would do a hota test, a which was to, a a J. J. yeah, but J. it was a, a huh, yeah, J. Okay, but the sound is the H sound. And they would line the people up and go down the line, and whoever could not say the word with the H could, would be shot. And, and that this, was, this was one of their, the, the way the Dominicans treated the Haitians. So that's a little bit of history of how they feel about them. One other point of history, which is that uh, Haiti won its independence from France, but don't forget that the Dominican Republic won its independence from Haiti. Question refers to uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Pizzullo's last presentation before the Council, in which he talked about conflict resolution uh, throughout the world. And one of the observations was that perhaps American military being re retrained could contribute uh, in various uh, uh, trouble spots or potential trouble spots. And uh, this theme of conflict resolution is very dear to Ambassador Pizzullo's heart. Uh, and I think he uh, has uh, given it a lot of thought, and I'm sure that he probably has shared some of that thinking with Mr. Berger. I wish he were here to answer it uh, from the perspective of whether there's been a real change in Washington and whether as a practical matter, he knows how to implement it. Uh, my own view is I don't think it's a role for the military particularly. Uh, I think it's a role. I think uh, certainly the Cold War has ended and, and the government, and it's not because we have Clinton, any government is not trying to fight the Cold War. It is trying to figure out how to have an ordered world. It's so far, it doesn't look too good. Uh, we certainly have not figured out how to broker conflict resolution uh, in Bosnia. There may be not really figured it out in Cambodia, although there's sort of a success story going on in Cambodia right now, but the success is partly through the military defeat of the Khmer Rouge, which is going on. Um, I'm relatively pessimistic. I don't know how he'd be. Uh, the question is, is the United States going to do anything about this situation? If we did intervene, would we be chastised? The United Nations. I'm sorry. Is the United Nations going to do anything about this? If we went in, would we be chastised? And I think implicitly, you're also asking whether anything can be done to improve the situation. I, I don't think the United States could go into Haiti without drawing a lot of criticism, uh, which is why every time the United States goes into a, a neighboring country, it tries to, at least in modern times, tries to get someone to go along with it, like uh, Brazilians or whatever, as they did in the Dominican Republic. Uh, a situation can develop that is so hideous that initially the intervention is welcome and even all over the world. Somalia was a good example of that. Um, and in the end, in Somalia, I don't think, some people criticize the United States, but the criticism wasn't, wasn't very bitter. It was just the Somalis were so difficult. I don't think there's any reason to think the Haitians might not be difficult too, uh, because they tend to be very nationalistic. And Dan may be right, maybe it's something we'll will power an intervention in Haiti. Uh, I couldn't, I can't see what it would be. I can't foresee what it would be. Uh, for one reason, I think it's a kind of a, a very, an issue of very low priority on the Clinton agenda. Uh, I don't see anywhere <coughs> a constituency forming that would be big enough, I don't think the Black Caucus is big enough, big enough to, to power it, to power that kind of very dramatic policy change. And uh, especially in view of the fact that I think the military would be, our military would be saying, no, 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 no. I think, too, one of, 
one of the things you've got to figure is that there, it's going to, if, if there is uh, an intervention, I think, I really believe it's going to have to be multilateral, I, 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 hemispheric at least. I, I don't know how, if we did it, unless, unless, unless there was some kind of act of hostility where uh, our ambassador was shot or something, I mean, I just can't see us going in there unilaterally. But I do think that, that it would be hard to get a multilateral force, get, even though in the hemisphere people generally support what the United States feels, or the support that we should reinstate our esteem. Um, no one feels that strongly that they want to send their people there, I don't think. I mean, the, the United States might if you saw a wave of immigrants. And I think that also in the next few weeks, this, this ploy, this thing that our Aristide has done, which is to, you know, abrogate the treaty, or the, it was not a treaty, it was a, an agreement on immigration. I think in the next few days, we're going to see, see exactly how that plays out, because if, if if, if he gives the signal, if he says something, he does have quite a lot of power to have people act. Now, whether or not people would risk their lives and decide to uproot and come to the United States in a great wave to make a point, I don't know. But I think it'll be interesting to see what exactly he's got up his sleeve um, with regard to this abrogation of the agreement. Uh, so. The United Nations isn't it or them, uh, it's us. It's a mechanism that governments use when it's useful or convenient to use it. Uh, I suspect that any kind of American uh, plan, uh, whether it's an intervention or somewhat less than that, uh, my guess is uh, the U.S. would prefer to use the mechanism of the Organization of American States, which is based in Washington, and which is just a little smaller and clubbier and a little more involved. Please speculate on what the impact would be of Aristide in power. Well, you've got eight months of him on record there, and the eight months were not free of human rights abuses, and uh, America's Watch will tell you that. It, 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 w though it was much lower than it usually was, there, w there was, um, he did not, um, tell people not to do retribution, to do, uh, they call it deshocage, which is uprooting of the old structure. He never told people not to do that. Um, he did have a record of not working with the Supreme Court, the, the judicial system. Uh, he would often take things into his own hands, so it was never, never like what the military has done. I mean, I, I have to say that. But he did not use that system, and Parliament, he would constantly uh, overrule or, or do things that, that went around the system of, of, of democratic government, uh, none of which became an abuse, but it was not cooperative. It was not, uh, not what you'd call an active democracy. Um, so there's eight months of that. Also economically, there, there are many people who know that, that the World Bank and um, the, uh, I'm trying to think who, I mean, many, many people wanted to help them. I mean, the United States had funds ready to help them, but they didn't have uh, people qualified in the fina uh, finance ministry that were actually actively seeking these funds that were available. And they, there was some alarm because they, they weren't supplying, they weren't putting people in government who were actively going out to get what they needed to make the economy go. And so that's part of it too. Larry Pizzullo, Ambassador Pizzullo, of course, is the ultimate insider on, on this question. And he probably even has the answers to the questions which were raised about what he thinks about these matters. Um, and uh, I know he'll be with us. I'm confident he'll be with us at some time in the not too distant future when it's possible. And I think it'll be a, a very, very interesting evening. Although it's very hard to imagine an evening much more interesting than the one that the panel has provided us with. And we appreciate that.